Thanks, Debbie, and thanks, Craig, for a great presentation. So I'm Jason Doctor, Doctor Doctor. I'm going to talk today about um, social influences and nudging doctors using uh, behavioral economics. As Craig mentioned, the traditional view of the clinician or the provider is that they're, they're rational and they act in their own self-interest, and that that means that they're reflective, that they're logical, that they're deliberate in their thinking. And in the fields of health services and health informatics, uh, they've adopted this view as well, and, and, and they have developed decision support interventions like alerts and reminders in education, which just suggests that maybe the clinician forgot or uh, they needed a reminder or they just don't know and they need additional education. Uh, health economists and economists in general come at this, this view with uh, monetary incentives. And not, monetary incentives aren't necessarily bad, uh, but the view is uh, that they operate independently of clinician self-image or their in intrinsic motivation. So this behavioral view is a little different, and this view is that the clinician f faces time constraints in their workplace, and that they engage in cognitively challenging work, so they don't necessarily have the time to be rational and deliberate all of the time. Their thinking is fast, and it's affected by how information is presented to them, and Craig presented a lot of information about that. Um, also, monetary rewards are not a simple additive motivator, but could have other effects. For example, it's possible that a monetary award could crowd out intrinsic motivation. And social cues could affect their decision making. So if we look at what's been done in the past with things like decision support and alerts, usually what they try to do is stop the provider from what they're doing, reason with them, and pre present them with these sort of long pop-up alerts which show, which explain why what they're doing is incorrect and, and why they should think about doing something else. And if you look at how that's worked, there, there was a review by Bright in 2012 which showed that the results are really mixed and oftentimes decision support alerts don't, don't work at all. And there's something also called alert fatigue where clinicians will just ignore alerts completely because they get so many of them. If you look at pay for performance, it hasn't been as effective as we would have hoped uh, Cochrane Review in 2011 said that there was insufficient evidence to support or not support financial incentives. Again, the data are very mixed. And a large study in the UK uh, on pay for performance showed that large incentives, about 25% of the uh, primary care physician's pay, seemed to work. However, what, what happened in this study, uh, which was published in the New England Journal, was that non-incentivized measures got worse. So it's not a simple additive equation. And then there was a recent JAMA paper in 2013, which was one of the first large randomized trials of uh, pay for performance in the U.S., and they found non-significant trends but no evidence of real uh, significant effects. So uh, what we know is that clinicians uh, are often rational but not always rational. They may respond to large incentives. These incentives have complicated effects. Uh, their rationality is constrained by the pace of their work. Um, they don't always have choice sets or decisions that they're making that, that really distinguish good and bad outcomes immediately, so they don't know exactly what's going to happen. Um, and their decisions might be influenced by outside factors. So this sort of leads us to when is it appropriate to take this behavioral view of the clinician. And I, and I just want to be careful to say that I, I'm, I don't want people to believe that we, sh we should think that providers or clinicians are completely irrational, but certainly when there's no strong preferences uh, in their choice set, and there's uh, some negative externality involved, then that's when we should consider this behavioral view. So for example, I can use behavioral economics to kind of nudge you to choose a yellow house over a blue house by framing things a certain way, but it would be impossible for me to use behavioral economics to have you choose living in a cave over a yellow house. So that's how we have to think about this for uh, uh, medicine and how we apply it to medicine. And so, where do we have these situations where there's not a big difference, not a strong preference, but there's maybe a, a really uh, serious uh, negative consumption externality? Well, those things might be like imaging for low back pain. The patient comes in, they get an image, no harm, no foul. They get a little radiation, but over many of these images, they're both expensive and they expose patients to risk of cancer. Antibiotic prescribing, again, the same type of thing. There's this potential for antibiotic resistance. 
hand hygiene, as Craig mentioned, is another area where infection can propagate. So that's where I think it's best. And our group and others have been interested in using nudges to change clinician behavior in some recent studies. And we've been doing this using field experiments. And in these experiments, what we do is we develop large data networks of clinics, and then we provide nudges. We'll be talking more th about this at our 3 o'clock session that Debbie mentioned. And uh, our group in particular has been interested in acute respiratory infections, and these represent 10 percent of all ambulatory visits. Um, about 40 percent of the people who come to these visits, they get antibiotics, and about half of those the antibiotics are inappropriate, meaning that the antibiotics were prescribed for a viral infection. So uh, this has obviously problems. It increases cost. It's expensive to deliver all these inappropriate prescriptions, potential for antibiotic resistance. And patients themselves can have adverse drug events. Prior research has uh, shown that education and other sort of standard approaches are only modestly effective, reducing prescribing about five percentage points uh, when it's at about a 50 percent inappropriate rate. So we decided to take a different approach, and what we did was go to the social psychology literature, and we looked at work by Robert Cialdini, who has done, a, he went out in the field and, and actually worked with people who, salespeople and others, who've had to influence people in their jobs, and if they didn't, they would, well, they wouldn't get paid, so that was a, a good incentive for them to learn how to influence people. And he came up with these principles of influence, reciprocity, social norms, which I'm going to call peer comparison, commitment and consistency, liking, authority, and scarcity. I'm not going to talk about all of these, but I just will mention social norms and commitment and consistency. So this peer comparison or social norms idea uh, was first field tested in, the, in energy uh, conservation. Uh, research by uh, Schultz, Noah Goldstein, and Cialdini, and later Hunt Alcott published a large study uh, conducted by Opower uh, on 550,000 homes. And what they did was they tried to get people to conserve energy by showing their energy consumption compared to an efficient neighbor and also compared to all neighbors. And if you're doing well, as, as uh, this person was, their consumption was lower than the efficient neighbor, they got a couple of happy faces and it said, you're doing a great job that injunctive norm ended up keeping them from using more energy. When they didn't put that in, people actually used more energy because they saw they were using less than others. <laughs> if you weren't doing so well, um, you could see that your bar was uh, quite a bit higher and you might have gotten a sad face. Um, this reduced energy, energy consumption in this large uh, study published by Alcott by 2 percent, and it, it's equivalent to increasing price, energy prices by 11 to 20 percent to get that same reduction, only by putting this little printout on your bill. Um, and if it was applied nationally, it would reduce the U.S. carbon footprint, the entire carbon footprint for all, uh, for all carbon uh, by 1 percent. Uh, the other area I want to just briefly mention, and Daniela Meeker is going to talk about her study at 3 o'clock, is commitment and consistency. So human beings value being consistent and to others and showing that they follow through with what they say they're going to do. And so if you get them to pre-commit to something, uh, they're more likely to follow through with it. And uh, what Daniela did in her study was uh, have clinicians commit to uh, only prescribing antibiotics when appropriate and, and to use them judiciously. And uh, she had them post these commitments in their exam rooms and then she followed patients uh, over the course of a year to see how that affected their prescribing. And it turned out it had a pretty remarkable effect, almost a 20 percent reduction in inappropriate prescribing, which could have saved, uh, if it was applied nationally and if that effect held up, it might, it might be somewhat less, but it would save uh, $70 million and avert 2.6 million inappropriate prescriptions. So just to summarize, uh, I, I, I really believe that nuanced research into human behavior can inform quality improvement, and particularly these cases where uh, there's a negative consumption externality involved. Um, these early results that we're getting suggest that these effects of non-monetary incentives are substantial and should be taken seriously. 
And certainly we should also consider the larger social environment and how clinicians interact with each other and how that might affect their behavior. So thank you very much.